Welcome to Hong Kong Confidential. I'm Jules Hannaford and I'm your host. I'm an Australian woman and I've been living in Hong Kong for many years. I'm a mother, a teacher, an author, and I want to share my wisdom and the wisdom of others with you. Thanks for joining me and I hope you enjoy the show. Today I'm here with Sky Skew, the Executive Director of the Kelly Support Group. Hi Sky, thanks for joining us. Hi Jules, thanks for having me. Sky, I wonder if you could tell me a bit about your background and how you came to be working at Kelly Support. I'm a Hong Konger, but I don't really sound Chinese. Mostly it's because I didn't grow up in Hong Kong. Uh, my parents moved to Ghana in West Africa to do community development work when I was about the age of one. And so I've spent my formative years and key childhood in Ghana and West Africa. And in my time there, I went to local schools. I went to an international school as well at some point. And I think I've always had a special interest in healthcare, particularly amongst adolescents and young people, and the importance of peer support. And one of the biggest things was when I was in Form 5, so that would be Year 10, Year 11, Uh, My best friend actually committed suicide uh, trying to use drugs as a way to OD. Fortunately, it didn't work out, but I think that to me and my group of friends was a huge shocker because we hadn't realized that she was really unhappy about certain things and we had sort of drifted apart as you do in high school a little bit. And so to find out the news from her mom when that happened was uh, an eye-opening experience for me and also something that made me really want to think about how at that time, as a young person, I could have helped her as her friend. And, you know, fast forward 15 years now, um, I'm a working professional. My background's in public health practice. And my role working with Kelly Support Group and being the executive director, I think it really gives me a unique opportunity to really speak on behalf of these young people and to really understand youth where they're coming from versus coming from an adult or even a parent's perspective. I think the unique thing that I've really enjoyed about working where I am today is really being able to see how we can connect with young people in the way that they need to be connected to and be able to allow them the space and freedom to think about difficult things that they face every single day. We don't sometimes think as adults that issues of relationship or exams, you know, or even the fact that we have to write a report that's due tomorrow and amidst a lot of other things, you know, we sometimes think, well, that's, you know, what life is, you know, and we've all gone through that. But we often forget in that moment when we're back there 15 years ago, you know, how important that moment or any one of those moments are to a young person's life. And so for me, that's kind of how I came to be at Kelly Support Group and to be doing the work that I'm doing today. How interesting. So were you in Ghana or in Africa when you had that incident with your friend when you were at school? Yes, I was in Ghana. And were you aware as a teenager of mental health issues for young people and the struggles that young people face? Not at all. We didn't have a thing called well-being back in those days. Uh, We didn't even have classes on drugs or alcohol. You know, it wasn't something that you talked about in school or with parents, but it's certainly a hot topic amongst your circle of friends. I remember um, a couple of my classmates were drug dealers. There was a couple of kids who got drunk every weekend and went to parties on the weekends as well. And it was just the norm. And if I look at what's happening around us today in a totally different continent, in a totally different city, the same thing is happening here, right here in Hong Kong. So it's uh, it's very interesting to also see that, you know, it doesn't matter what background you're from, whether you're rich or poor, whether you are going to an international school, local school, whether you're in a developing country or a developed city like Hong Kong, some of these things and struggles that young people face is quite universal and it's global. Would you say that there's more of a dialogue happening about these issues that young people are facing in this day and age compared to when we were younger? I definitely think so. I think that it's not just us that are more aware. I think young people themselves are also more aware. I think with the internet and with accessible information always on their fingertips, you know, they probably are more well-versed in these language than we are. But they may use a different way of expressing it, or they may um, they may phrase things quite differently, or they may approach things very differently. So I definitely think you know today's generation is much more well versed than we were when we were young. Certainly, I think that's so true. What sort of work do Kelly support do with young people in Hong Kong? 
So Kelly Support Group, we have a very unique story as well. As an organization, we're about 25 years old now. Um, and we started because there were a couple kids in Hong Kong who were finding it really difficult, uh, struggling with addiction, with drugs, with alcohol. And they felt that the reason why they started was because they had nowhere to go. They didn't have any support. And so a couple of them, after coming out from rehab, actually came back to Hong Kong and started approaching schools and saying, can I share my story? Can we form support groups? Can we have a helpline? And so in the early days, even before we became a formal organization, there was a hotline that was manned by teens, four teens in some girl's living room. We were a a group that met in different places around Hong Kong. I believe there were groups that met in school campuses. There were groups that met at like uh, coffee shops. And the whole point was Kelly's support group is here. We are the same age as you. We're here to listen. Uh, We're here to have conversations. It wasn't about experts providing expert care. It was about peer support. And I think that that's so important. And 25 years later, we've obviously evolved and grown as an organization. We, we've moved away from hotlines. We've moved away from going onto basketball courts and picking kids off the streets. Yeah. But we've moved to a more preventative approach because we know young people are so well knowledgeable about things today. It's important to have conversations early and in advance before it's too late. I think a lot of different groups in Hong Kong, other NGOs, other government groups have put a lot of resources on direct services to help those who are struggling. But majority of our young people aren't actually struggling, already addicted to things or already at that point of, you know, self-harm. They're at the brink of it. They're exploring, they're experimenting, they're still dealing with the early parts of their well-being. And so a lot of what we're doing today um, as an organization is being proactive about starting these conversations earlier. We want to make sure that young people are informed about um, anything that they might get involved with. We want to make sure that they build resilience. I think we hear this word a lot, but I think for us, how we define resilience is a young person who is able to enter into a difficult circumstance and be able to walk out confident and proud of the decision that they've been able to make, regardless of who's around them. So from what you're saying, it's about preventative measures, opening up the conversation, helping young people to make good choices. Absolutely. So in what ways do you promote these aspects of for young people? Well, we do it through a couple of ways. We have our school-based programs that we run. We work with local schools, Chinese schools. We work with communities where there's predominantly ethnic minority groups. But we also work with a lot of international schools as well, because we fully believe that every young person, no matter what their background, uh, deserves support and deserves to have a chance to have this kind of conversation. So we run a lot of life skills based programs. Uh, We use a positive youth development approach. But we also do direct drug prevention. When we refer to drugs, we also include alcohol in the conversation. So direct prevention education uh, and curating conversations around these topics uh, and engaging young people in these discussions as well. Um, And another way that we do it also is through harm reduction education, because we acknowledge that if you are a young person, a certain percentage of them are going to be experimenting. And if in in the event that they might be doing that, we want to make sure that they have all the information that they need to make smart decisions and smart choices and to be able to save a life. And one of our biggest things that we really believe is to speak on behalf of young people. So to gather their feedback, to use our organization as a platform to share what they're thinking and feeling to the general public and to have their words be heard. So I see you guys at Clock and Flap and yeah. uh, the Rugby Sevens and events like that. What are you doing at those events and how are you helping young people? That's a classic example of our outreach work for harm reduction because we um, are very proactive at seeking out opportunities where we will have large scale events that are outdoors and places where we know young people will be at. Our approach is not to be a dampener on everyone's fun. It's to kind of be a gentle reminder of the kind of support that young people can give to each other, but also allow them to have fun in a safe way. We're also at other music festivals um, in Hong Kong, but the whole premise of it is to really provide a safe space for people who might want to take a break. We provide uh, water hydration reminders. We have safety packs, you know, how to have fun safely, and just a chance for people to have a conversation and a a quiet spot in the midst of, you know, a large event um, like Clock and Flap or even at Sevens. 
And do you ever find yourself having to work with the ambulance services and sort of hand kids over that are in a difficult state and get them properly looked after? Absolutely. I mean, our our team is all first aid trained and we have volunteers that are highly qualified as well. We're quite picky about who supports us and volunteers with us at those kind of events. But absolutely, I think um, it's the best way to do it, um, to be collaborating with everybody who is running the events. And that goes from, you know, the event organizers to anybody who is a medic on site to even the security guys, you know, just to kind of be an in-between voice for the young people and whatever organization uh, and, and events that they're at. Is this something that has been growing and growing and it really sort of helps promote Kelly support amongst other platforms like schools and, and families and actual, you know, parents reaching out for help for their kids? Is that a way that you're sort of building your profile and becoming better known in Hong Kong? I think that if you grew up in Hong Kong in the early 90s, you probably have already heard about Kelly Support Group because we were a grassroots movement organization that started amongst the youth themselves. I reckon we are probably more well known in some of the schools that we first started our quote unquote talks at, and they were mostly within the international school sector. But over the last 25 years, we've really grown in popularity also with the local community and particularly in uh, in amongst more disadvantaged populations, including those from ethnic minority groups. And so I think that, you know, partly people will know us through the work that we run in schools. We do work with quite a lot of schools, um, on average about 70 to 80 secondary schools in a year. And we have such a variety of programs that we offer different schools as well. So I think that a lot of people will know of us through those channels. But then, of course, some of these outdoor events are quite high profile as well. So you have your schools program, you have your outreach program. What else do you offer? I think one of the greatest things that I would what would say at Kelly is a partnership with young people. And what that means is, you know, they may come in as volunteers, they may come in wanting cast hours, they may come in just because they really care about a topic on well-being. And uh, we, we invite young people actually to partner with us to work on uh, issues that they really are passionate about and to do something that is wider scale on either on their school campuses or actually for Hong Kong. So I can give you an example. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a group of students from an international school who were really keen on talking about mental well-being. And they worked with us for a year and they came up with a series of projects uh, throughout the entire academic year from doing a school-wide talk to doing uh, a carnival thing on campus to doing product sales for fundraising, to raise awareness of certain topics regarding mental well-being. And um, they even designed cards, <laughs> you know, that had really cool messages on it as well. And so that's one way, you know, that students have worked with us and partnered with us as well. Another aspect is we've had students who, particularly those from ethnic minority background, who really feel quite discriminated in Hong Kong as being a way where uh, they feel like they're not as able to reach the potential. And so uh, we've partnered with them in producing, uh, and actually we're in the process of doing one right now in preparation for March 31st for next year, Anti-Racism Day. That's something that uh, we're doing in collaboration with a university partner as well. So it's an opportunity for young people in Hong Kong if they're really passionate about a certain topic and it's it's something that uh, we at Kelly also care about and there's alignment we're more than happy to work together with them to do something, uh, make an impact in Hong Kong. And I believe that young people, I mean, that's how we started as an organization. So we want to encourage more young people to be giving in that sense and to be making an impact uh, no matter where they are. So where is your base in Hong Kong if young people want to find you? Our base is a little bit far away, but nevertheless, we're very easy to find. Most easily found on Facebook or on our website, kelly.org, or people can call us um, or email us. But really, our physical location is on Fort Road across from Island School. But we mostly would like to have our base on school campuses, different school campuses that we work on. So because we recognize that it is quite fun to get a hold of us. But otherwise, social media is probably the best way to get in touch with us. And do your volunteers at Kelly Support work with teachers as well? Our volunteers definitely work with teachers as well, but I think majority of our volunteers are actually under the age of 20 because we are mostly working with young people and we invite young people to to Mm. volunteer with us. So they are the larger population um, of those who volunteer with us. If your question is about whether or not teachers can volunteer with us, 
Yes, absolutely. We would love to have more teachers. Actually. Do you have an age limit on your staff? No, I guess with volunteers, it doesn't really matter as long as you you have a heart and you you really want to do something and you want to do something either for your peers, uh, for your school community, for Hong Kong as a wider city. Uh, we're really open to anybody. I think you know some of the things that people have volunteered with us have been from. Campaigns, physical or social media ones, um, volunteer with data, you know, because research is a really important component of something that we do as well to understand trends, to understand what people are saying about different things. We also invite people to do fundraising with us as well. Any kind of volunteer work, really. So there's loads of opportunities for yeah, people absolutely. if they want to get yeah. involved and and make a difference in the community. And yeah. I think that's one of the big things is that you really are a part of the community and making mm-hmm. a difference. Do you have a drop-in center for troubled teens? Is that something that young people do if they're troubled or having mental health issues? We used to have a hotline, uh, as I mentioned earlier, but we've transitioned out of that because we realize that young people don't actually call anymore. And they don't necessarily because they're all texting. Yeah, they're all texting. <laughs> so I mean, we've moved to email and social media, and that's always open for people to message us and drop us a line. We work with a lot of groups that do specifically counseling and therapy, if that's something that people are looking for. But a lot of times, you know, some people just want to have a chat, and that's something that. Our team is quite often on Facebook Messenger, where we're meeting young people through the programs that we're running and having a lot of conversations stemming off of those. So, would you refer a, a team that you were concerned about onto counselling or psychologists and things like that if you felt there was a need? Yes, absolutely. We don't offer that uh, for ourselves as an organisation, but we definitely have um, a referral system. So, how did you come to be the director of Kelly Support? So I actually joined the organization six years ago as a youth worker, running programs, and there was a spot open shortly after I joined to manage the programs. And so that was something that was my forte is program development and monitoring evaluation. So aside from a huge passion of working with young people, I did have a lot of the backgrounds to manage and develop programs as well. So. I stepped into that role quite soon after joining the organization, and a couple of years ago, our executive director at that time moved back to uh, where he was living before, and so there was an opportunity, um, and the board offered me a seat and said, "Would you like to try your hands at uh, leading this organization?" And um, although I felt quite inexperienced and quite young at the time, um, I thought, you know what, this is an organization that I love. If anybody were to ask me what I would do or what my dream job would be, I probably would say something very similar to Kelly's support group. It's been a dream job, I would say. Maybe job isn't the right word. I would say probably a life calling to be able to work with young people in the way that we are, and to be able to connect with young people and to be able to speak on their behalf. I think it's such a privilege to be able to do that in any case in any scenario as well. Yeah, I completely agree with you, and have an understanding as a teacher of what that's yeah. like to really make a difference and connect with young people and be there for them. Do you have any anecdotal evidence of differences that you've made that you could talk to us about? Well, I would definitely say, you know, I think in the last few years, uh, what we've realized is because Kelly has been around for twenty some years, we are only now starting to see how young people have responded to our initial support many years ago. And we've certainly had a lot of people, both who have volunteered, who have worked at Kelly when they were in their early years, even before they went off to college, they were working at Kelly. Or maybe they were direct beneficiaries of Kelly Support Group coming up to us and letting us know how big of a difference、um, the organization had made in their life、um, and in their time as a teenager. We've had moms and dads come up to us and tell us about how Kelly really helped their kid, and now that their kid is stable, you know, doing well, and not in Hong Kong, but you know, at least we we hear a lot of really good things about you know families feeling very grateful that we've been able to help them in the past. Uh, we've also had a lot of young people who have come back to work for us at Kelly, and so that's something that we feel has had a really positive thing because not only have these young people made a decision to move into the NGO space to help other young people, but they felt the organization had made a significant impact on their lives, and so that you know they would make a choice to come back to work for the organization. So, do you have a team of people employed at Kelly, and then you have a group of volunteers that volunteer their time as well? Is that how、Absolutely. it works? Yes, yes. And、um, so, we are a official registered charity, and we have been for a while. 
And we have a total of 14 staff that are part of the team that are working full time、uh, to make all these wonderful initiatives happen in schools. And so our staff are mostly. We're all very young, very dynamic, <laughs> lots of creative energy for sure. I think you kind of have to have that when you're working with young people. But we come from different backgrounds. Some of us are grew up in Hong Kong, some of us didn't. A lot of us、uh, are Chinese, where we also represent、uh, groups from different ethnic minority populations as well. We're a bilingual organization, I would say, for the most part. Yeah, that's great that you have that diversity because Hong Kong is so diverse. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? It's not just diversity in in our ethnicities or our backgrounds, but it's also diversity in our our work. And what I mean is that we have a team of people who are from counseling backgrounds, public health, social work, youth worker, psychology backgrounds. So I think having a really good mix in this day and age helps us in our work with young people to be able to present a perspective, especially when you're designing programs for young people. I think it's quite important to have this diversity of skill sets and also theories to be able to provide the best、uh, program for young people. I think it's really evident that when you do come into schools, it's great to see these young people sharing their knowledge with the students, and I think the students feel a real connection. And I think they're、yeah. very interested because they're being、uh, educated by people that are not their teachers、yeah. from out in the community, and that they're, they're much younger and funkier.、Yeah. <laughs> and I think all of that really helps. And I've seen、yeah. that you really capture the attention of the young people and get them really on board, which is great.、Yeah. And it's so、Thank、nice,、you. yeah, so nice to hear that that's. Develop from starting with the international schools and moving out into the local schools because yeah, that was、absolutely. actually something I was really wondering if you're、yeah. getting a wider reach in the community. Absolutely, absolutely, and we definitely have been able to do that.、Um, when I look back at our history, I think the first couple years were mostly within the English speaking community, but quite soon after that, we felt that there was a huge need for this type of prevention work amongst local schools as well, and so we have. Since you know, shortly after we started as an official organization, working with local schools as well. You mentioned earlier about creativity, activity, and service CAS.、Mm-hmm. So, if young people, students in the international school or local school environment, wanted to come and work with you or volunteer for CAS, yes, how can they go about that?、Um, they can just email us. To be honest, we're very responsive in emails. The best thing to do would be actually to have a project in mind. What sort of thing would they do? Can you give me an example of what you might mean by a project? A project could be anything from a topic that they'd like to discuss and have in mind how they would like to see that happen in their school. I think it's about deciding on a topic, deciding whether it's something that they want to do on social media at their school campuses, a citywide thing. The nature of it is it more awareness raising? Is it educational? Is it for fundraising purposes? You know, and I think that all of these things are good questions to ask yourself to really culminate an idea of what a project could look like. And it could be something as simple as I want to write a poem about my experiences of struggling with mental health and the reasons why I would choose to do drugs because of what I'm struggling with. Can somebody help me? And that could be a project in itself, and that's something that we could highlight in one of our social media posts and put some light on it to raise awareness. And it can be done anonymously. It could be done、um, under a you know a pen name, and who knows? Maybe a young person might start a career that way. I would say there's so many different possibilities.、Mm. You're only limited by your imagination, exactly. aren't you? Exactly. Yeah, we've had kids who come up to our office and said, "I have no idea what I want to do." But I know that I want to do something related to the discussion about alcohol. What what can I do? And, and you so, help them develop、yeah. their ideas. Exactly. So our team will sit down with them and say, "Well, what's your timeline? Do you, do you want to partner with Kelly to do it?" I mean, most of it is because we're an official organization. It's great to partner with a local organization and then be able to do things. And sometimes we're able to magnify the effect that the kids have designed. Can you give me an example of a great project that you've seen develop through young people? Well, this idea that、uh, I was just talking about, referencing earlier, a young university student, she、um, is really quite passionate about discrimination in Hong Kong amongst、uh, ethnic minorities, 
And she was very inspired watching this documentary that was done in the US about stories of minorities in the US. And so she is putting together a bunch of stories, personal stories of different ethnic minority youth that are living here in Hong Kong. And we're going to be working with uh, one of the u- local universities here in Hong Kong and um, actually celebrating the diversity and making a point of how diverse Hong Kong actually is next year on Anti-Discrimination Day. Great. So how is she yeah. going to present all of these stories? Um, in video format. Oh, wow. Yes. How cool. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So we've been working with her. If you look at our Facebook, you might see, you know, we're gathering stories. I'm inviting different people to apply, you know, to share their unique stories growing up here in Hong Kong. And obviously it's all youth focused. Um, so uh, we want to make sure that our young people have that voice as well. So partnering with her has been really fun. You're listening to Hong Kong Confidential a podcast where Hong Kong people share their wisdom and experiences with us. I'm Jules Hannaford, and Sky Sue is now going to talk to us about third culture kids. Do you have an opinion on third culture kids in Hong Kong and how it affects them? I definitely do, being a third culture kid myself. I definitely feel that having a, the identity crisis is always a good point to start. I think it's very difficult to grow up in another culture that's different from your parents' culture. Then also being within particular school culture as well, I think that there's a lot of elements of how you are able to find who you are. And I think that that compounds when you are in your teenage years because there is so much that you are already dealing with that to have an additional component of being a third culture kid is definitely something that can really affect how you see yourself and your value and your worth as well. Do you feel that some Hong Kong kids struggle with finding their own identity? I think all kids do. Mm. Um, I think all young people do. It's an, yeah. it's an important part of development from becoming a, from a child to becoming a young person. I think that it's a it's an important struggle to go through. It's not necessarily a negative or a positive thing, but I think that everyone needs to struggle through finding who they are and finding what they're most comfortable at. And but the key thing here is. To be able to be in a safe enough environment that they can explore that and to be in a nurturing environment that they can explore that as well and to be in a supportive environment so that they can be nurtured in that as well. So I think that for anyone who is working with third culture kids, the most important thing is to have some sort of stability and a lot of openness and non-judgmentalness to allow them to explore and to learn. And you don't have to be a third culture kid actually to also need to find your own identity. I think with everything that's happening, you know, socially in Hong Kong, politically, but also just with a lot of people who are from expat backgrounds in Hong Kong, I think the diversity of our community lends the question that everyone is probably trying to figure out who they are. How has the landscape of drug and alcohol use with young people evolved in the six or eight years you've been working at Kelly Support, do you think? I think there's two ways to look at it. I think there's the official way of looking at it where you're looking at government statistics and you're looking at more uh, wider trends. When you're looking at it from the more official point of view, I think drug use amongst young people has gone down. It's gone down in terms of numbers, and a lot of that is based on reported numbers. Um, so if somebody's been hospitalized, if somebody's been in an accident, or somebody's been checked into a rehab, for the non-official aspect of it, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of young people who are still experimenting. And the fact that in Hong Kong, drugs are quite easily accessible. Young people in Hong Kong can afford it. And it's not a, a poverty kind of situation where you think that oh, only people who are poor will do drugs and, and consume too much alcohol. In fact, you know, we are a middle, it's a middle class issue where we're seeing, you know, the accessibility is allowing young people to do whatever they want. I think that we're seeing a lot of uh, the effects of some potential drug use that has become addictions in terms of the mental well-being of young people. There's a lot of research globally that shows that there's a high correlation of uh, mental health and substance misuse because it's uh, young people are turning to substances. Uh, I mean, statistically, even in Hong Kong, relief of boredom, stress, anxiety, depression is the number one reason why young people are turning to drugs, illicit drugs. And so there's a very close correlation uh, between that. We know from just the effects of drugs that a lot of drugs actually will have long term mental health impact um, on young people as well. It would appear to me that young people have very easy access to alcohol in Hong Kong. Yes. Do you feel that they have easy access to drugs as well or is that a little bit more difficult? 
It's definitely a little bit more difficult. You can't rock up to yeah, Seven you know, Eleven. And <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. can't rock up to you know any convenience store and, and and buy you know a handful of pills. And I think that it is definitely not as accessible. I think that the discussion around alcohol and and drugs is definitely two separate ones and could have a total separate conversation about that. But either way, I think that the important thing is whether or not we're having these conversations and、um, discussions with young people in advance about this type of lifestyle that one may choose to have, you know, around alcohol or drugs. And I think that when when young people are not informed, when they have no idea, if they're coerced to do it under peer pressure, and they they just want to look cool, you know, they don't have a way out, and they enter into misuse、um, of either of these substances. I think that that's the last thing that we would ever want to see happen, and that's primarily one of the reasons why you know we have been so prominent in speaking about: Can we please have these conversations earlier? Can we be more preventative? Can we talk about these in schools as part of well-being classes? Because the conversation is not about whether or not you are going to take drugs or not, and how it's going to affect you. The conversation is a couple steps beforehand. Which is, you know, where you at in general as a person that you would feel one day you feel like you have no option but to take drugs or alcohol. Does that make sense? Totally、yeah. makes、yeah. sense. Do you feel that there are personal, social, and health education programs happening more in the international and local schools in Hong Kong? The students are becoming better educated about the risks and the dangers and the prevention methods and everything related to drugs and alcohol, and that that's helping inform young people and getting them to make safer choices. I would say that there are some schools who are putting more of a priority on this area, and for the schools who are placing a priority on this area, I think yes, it's definitely having a much better impact for young people because then they're becoming more informed. And they're becoming more educated when they're making certain choices. But I would say that there's still a lot of schools in Hong Kong who haven't caught up in the sense of having a very thorough curriculum to look at、um, some of these things. A one-hour workshop on drugs once a year—that's 45 minutes. To be honest, isn't quite enough. And our research shows us that it's the minimum that you must do. And we're very happy to continue doing it. But when you have conversations like this, it's important to then also get students to be involved in a personal project, you know, relating to that subject matter, or to have posters in your school that pertain to that subject matter that is designed by your students, you know, or to have a whole week that talks about healthy lifestyles, you know. So、mm -hmm. it's a combination of those things, and so. I think that we're slowly moving towards that area. I think a lot of schools are at least doing the first part, which is having one session on something. So it would be either about mindfulness or well-being or drugs or alcohol. But it's difficult, you know, because I understand that we're about academics in Hong Kong, aren't we? <laughs> But I would argue that being mentally and psychosocially developed, you know, as a young person in Hong Kong, is even more beneficial for your future academic abilities and your your ability to perform well、um, in school. Absolutely, I think that's really a philosophy of many of the schools. They're beginning to understand that if、yes. they have happy, healthy, well-adjusted young people、yeah. who are motivated and positive, then they're、mm -hmm. going to do much better in their studies. Yeah, absolutely. So it it works both ways. Yeah, and you、it? know. We were talking about. I mean, this is a little bit more technical here, but you know, we talk about what are the protective factors and how can you build protective factors in young people. And a lot of that is making sure that you know they're engaged in their school, making sure that they have、uh, trusted adults, whether it's a teacher, a mentor, somebody who's like the coach of the team that they're playing on, having a positive peer group, and all of these things. It's not something that's going to come out of a one-hour lecture.、It's、something that has to be thought through quite often. And I hope schools more and more will continue to do that. I think some of them have. There has to be a, a culture of support and understanding yes, and、exactly. acceptance. And、yeah. young people need to be able to come forward and talk about their fears and talk about their、mm. struggles and talk about the things that are troubling them. And I think that's what we're trying to encourage, and you're certainly trying to encourage with Kelly. And yeah, it's, it's a great way to promote well-being and promote mindfulness and promote positivity for young people. So、yeah. it's very, very important, isn't yeah. it? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that young people, in fact, I mean, I think that as a key leadership lesson for any young person, I think that they need to understand that they have much a uh, positive sway, a positive influence on their peers as they would a negative one. And to have that understanding that sometimes that they're in the best situation to help each other. Sometimes their conversations over WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, even on Snapchat comments can make such a huge difference in another person's life. Whereas, you know, that impact might be more than a one hour counseling session with a teacher. You know, you never know. But with I think that we, we have to encourage young people to know mm-hmm. that, that they can actually be of such a positive influence on their peers. Do you have a sense of whether cyberbullying is on the increase or the decrease, whether people are becoming more negatively affected by social media recently? I think the trend has always been there, that more and more people are feeling the negative effects of social media from various fronts. I think that, you know, recently there was a study done by the Hong Kong Federation of Youth Group about uh, cyberbullying and bullying in general, and the numbers were more on the rise as well. But I think that that's something that we have to be very proactive as well of having these conversations. If we are unable to provide young people with the right kind of positive development factors, then it's very easy that this is just another way that they're trying to express themselves or another way that they are, are acting. We mentioned that you accept volunteers. What sort of qualities do you look for in your volunteers and do they need any qualifications or training? I think it depends on the type of uh, volunteer work that you'd like to be a part of. Um, for the most part, uh, we don't have any prerequisites. Uh, I think just the willingness to come and do whatever it is that you would like to help us with, unless you are very specific in having an idea of how you would like to help the organization. So I think what I would say to anybody who is thinking about volunteering is, you know, have in mind um, what kind of thing that you'd like to do. Like, And it doesn't have to be just about Kelly. Research about the cause that you're passionate about and then look into how you can help an organization what they're existing doing, whether or not you can actually add to that, or if you can help them in other ways. I recently had a conversation with a young person who was entering university, and she was thinking, oh, I just want to help out. And I said to her, well, well, how do you want to help out? You know, she says, I don't really know how to help out. And we walked through this whole process of, well, what are you interested in? Are there organizations that are doing what you're interested in? And she actually ended up telling us that she was really interested in statistical analysis of trends. And so we had her come in to help us look at our evaluations of programs that we did for the last year. And she was able to help us, you know, put together nice charts. And that that was very helpful. I mean, is it something glam like setting up a hotline? No, not exactly. But it used her strengths and it was in alignment with her interests. And it was something that she was able to walk away from a two-week volunteer project thinking, I was able to do something really cool. And make a difference. And make a difference. Yeah, Yeah. And it made a huge difference for our team. So if our listeners want to donate to Kelly's support, how can they go about this? They can donate to us online on our website, kelly.org. We have a button that says donate. So they can go there um, quite easily and be able to let us know. Monthly donations would be very welcome, even if it's, you know, $50 a month. They, it all adds up. It all it? adds up. It really does. Um, and so we always welcome that. It's one less coffee a month. <laughs> and uh, another way that people can donate if they would like is if people are having their own different events, like a birthday party and friends rather than a present, they can donate the money to Kelly Support Group. Oh, that's a really um, nice idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that's or, something that people often don't think about, but yeah. it's, a, it's a great thing to yeah, do. Yeah, absolutely. It? Two summers ago, we had a young guy who uh, went and climbed up a mountain in Nepal. And, um, oh, good for him. Yeah. So he just did it randomly over the summer, mm. and he asked people to support him. And the money that he collected uh, was a donation to Kelly's support group. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I think there's something to be said for making a difference and giving back to the community. It's really good for the soul and makes you feel really good about yourself. Yeah. So anybody out there feeling a bit down, do something <laughs> to donate and yeah. do something to give back and yeah. you'll feel really good about Absolutely. yourself. And it's an opportunity to do something really fun as well. I mean, when we interviewed this guy, he said he really wanted to just challenge himself and climb up that mountain. But it was really motivating to know that there was 10 to 20 people that were actually putting down money to have him walk up that mountain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Cut then, back out. Exactly, and the money was going to a great cause. Sky, what are some of the key takeaways that young people might walk away with from your drug and alcohol education programs? I think the key takeaway is that the discussion about drugs and alcohol is not a taboo subject, and it's not one that should be a taboo subject. 
It's one that should be had, that is honest, that questions are always welcomed, and that you know they shouldn't be fearful of bringing up the subject matter with others. We hope that you know young people will walk away feeling like it was a very safe environment、um, to explore the discussions around drugs and alcohol, and to walk away feeling empowered. That they can make a really positive choice for themselves, and I think that that's really important thing that we would want young people to walk away with to feel equipped that if they do find themselves in a situation where alcohol or drugs is presented to them, that they would be able to feel confident to know what to do, and that regardless of their choice, you know that there will be people like our organization who will be there to support them. What advice would you give to a teenager who is struggling with mental health issues, depression, or anxiety, or just not feeling themselves or feeling good in their own skin? What would you suggest they do? I would definitely tell them to take a deep breath and to remind themselves that it's okay to be feeling that way. And then I would suggest that they find somebody that they really trust and have a chat about their honest feelings, and not to be afraid of admitting it. There is、uh, oftentimes a lot of stigma that comes with thinking that you are not good enough because you feel this way, or that you didn't do enough. That's why you feel this way, or that you might be feeling down. You know, but I think it's very normal, and it's very good to be able to to talk to somebody about it. It doesn't have to be always a professional. You know, the first step is just reaching out to someone. To 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 talk about it. It's not even necessarily help, but it's it's really just to to talk about things and to work out with another person what your next steps could be and should look like. And I would definitely say, you know, don't ignore it. The more you ignore it, the more you might have the tendency to want to、uh, use things like drugs and alcohol you know, to forget about it, which is which actually doesn't help. A lot of people,、mm. I think, media or even sometimes, you know, hearsay tells us that if you use substances, you know, and we, we this is always a myth that we talk about, you know, that if you use substances, then all your troubles will go away. But that is not true <laughs> because it's just a temporary band aid, you know. And a lot of times, you you are left waking up the next day thinking, right, I'm still here. And so, take a deep breath. It's okay to be feeling this way, and find somebody to have a chat about it. Don't feel like that you will be judged for it. Really good advice, and I hope if there's anyone out there listening who's not feeling that great at the moment and feels like they would benefit from talking to somebody, that they do find somebody that they can reach out and talk、Absolutely. to. Absolutely. I think sometimes for young people, it's good to find a teacher or a parent or an older person, perhaps, or so, you know, even reaching out to Kelly support. Yeah. Sometimes I find. I don't know if you agree that young people talking to their peers, they don't quite necessarily get the support and understanding that they could get from somebody who's a little bit older and has some more experience.、Mm. Do you agree? I think that young people, that from our observations today, they all actually really want to help their friends. Yeah. But I think that they may not know necessarily how to help their friends. Yeah. And so, for somebody who has a friend, you have a suspicious feeling that they need some support. Again, take a minute and don't ignore it, and actually reach out to that friend and reach out to figure out how to help them. And I think that while I do agree on certain levels, I think some conversations ought to be had with somebody who's older than you, or maybe with a little bit more experience. But I would say that in other situations, you know, I'm quite passionate of helping young people to know how to help their friends. Yes. And that, it's a good place yeah, to start, isn't it? And to be fair, so、start. many young people, when somebody is in trouble, they'll help them get the support.、Yeah. They'll help them get the courage to、exactly. seek out help from an、Absolutely. adult or a teacher or a parent. So、Absolutely. definitely,、yeah. I'm not saying don't speak to your friends, <laughs> but I'm just saying use all the resources available to yeah, you. There's、exactly. so many options, isn't yeah. there? We've been piloting a program that goes into school campuses and trains. Uh, small groups of young people who are interested to to help their friends. And, oh, that、uh, sounds great! Yeah, and it's called Talk to Me. We've been trying to do this、uh, for a couple years now. We've been looking for some funding and support to make it happen. But the initial results from it, regardless of the school campus, it's been fantastic, and the responses have been really good. That and, sounds brilliant. Yeah, we'd love to see. My personal vision is I'd love to see every school have a small cohort of teens who are actually trained. To be able to help their friends, and that they would be able to support other people in their in their school. 
and that not, sounds not like just, a super initiative yeah. for schools to get involved in. Yeah, and like individual schools have different cultures. So they might make it into a formal club. They might make it into, you know, the group that, you know, starts a hotline for just their school campus. They may decide that they're the school students who initiate well-being weeks. It doesn't really matter. It will look different. But at least what we're hoping is that we'll have a set curriculum that we can train young people to know how to support their friends. So fantastic. That sounds like such a great idea. And I hope that, you. you know, any teachers out there listening will bring this idea back to their school because I think it Absolutely. is really, really valuable and a great yeah. idea. Talk to me. It's as simple as that. <laughs> we will. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think some of the typical pressures that young people in Hong Kong face? I think the key one that everyone talks about is dealing with stress, dealing with um, how to deal with school. But I think it's compounded also with just the struggles of growing up as a teen. It's relationships. We see a lot of relationship with peers, as well as relationship with family as being a key point of uh, that triggers young people in terms of how they're doing. And uh, I think the third one would be Actually, particularly for those who are from different backgrounds, sort of stigmatization or discrimination against them, whether they're a special education needs young person or if they're from a different you know, minority group here living in Hong Kong. I think that those are all different things that we are seeing uh, for young people um, that are typical stressors. So Sky, thank you so much for coming in to talk to me today. It's been so informative and I really do hope that some of our listeners out there, whether they be young people or teachers or parents, will really find this invaluable and reach out for advice or support thank and, you, you know, utilise your organisation. Thank you so much. So that brings us to the end of another Hong Kong Confidential podcast. I'm Jules Hannaford. Thanks for joining me. And I hope you'll be with me again next week. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please can you go to iTunes to rate and review it. I would really appreciate your feedback. You can email me at jules at hongkongconfidential.net and you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Hong Kong Confidential. If you'd like to hit me up on Twitter, it's at Jules Hannaford. I would love to hear from you.